From the sitcom star who vanished on a fishing trip to the political philosopher who died under mysterious circumstances, we delve into the lesser-known stories behind the deaths of these unexpected celebrities. Bill Nunn Born into a world of sports, Bill Nunn was destined for a life of athletic pursuits. The son of a prominent sports journalist, he grew up immersed in the thrill of competition. His early life was a whirlwind of touchdowns and headlines, including a particularly daring escapade with future Pittsburgh Steelers president Art Rooney II. Together, they pulled off a mischievous joyride in the car of legendary defensive tackle Mean Joe Green, a secret they wouldn't reveal for years. Yet, fate had a different plan for none. While enrolled at Morehouse College with aspirations of political science, a spark ignited within him, a passion for acting that would irrevocably alter his trajectory. After graduating from Shenley High School in 1970 and Morehouse College in 1976, he started building his acting career. Guess who else was at Morehouse with him? Spike Lee. That connection would lead to Bill appearing in several of Spike Lee's early movies, including classics like School Days, 1988, and the iconic Do the Right Thing, 1989. His role as Radio Rahim in Do the Right Thing was a real standout. But Bill wasn't a one-trick pony. He went on to play a variety of memorable characters, from the enforcer Da Do Do Man in New Jack City, to roles in Blood Brothers and Money Train. He even reunited with Spike Lee again in He Got Game. Superhero fans might recognize him from all three of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies. Bill's talent wasn't limited to the silver screen, though. He also took his talents to Broadway, playing the acclaimed role of Walter Lee Younger in a 2004 production of A Raisin in the Sun. Bill also brought characters to life in productions like August Wilson's Fences, a play set in his own hometown of Pittsburgh. Sharing the stage with actors like Anthony Mackie, none captivated audiences not just on film, but also in live theater. Sadly, the world lost Bill Nunn in 2016. He passed away at his home in Pittsburgh at the age of 62. His wife, Donna, shared that he had been battling leukemia. While Bill Nunn may be gone, his legacy lives on, both through the characters he brought to life on screen and stage, and through the community he enriched with his compassion and dedication. Ben Smith Before Ben Smith was cracking us up in the Police Academy movies, he was a tough football player. He suited up for three different teams throughout his career, including the Baltimore Colts and the Oakland Raiders. After hanging up his cleats, Ben decided to try his hand at acting. And guess what? He landed a role that made him famous, Officer Moses Hightower in the Police Academy series. He was the quiet giant of the group, but always brought the laughs. Sadly, Ben passed away in 2011 at the age of 66. It turned out he had a health condition linked to playing football for so many years, along with some other heart problems. Later on, doctors also discovered he had a brain condition common in former athletes. Even though he's gone, Ben left us with a legacy of laughs thanks to his unforgettable performance in Police Academy. His performance in the 1989 film Lean on Me is a prime example. He portrayed a passionate educator determined to turn around a struggling inner-city school, showcasing his unwavering belief in the potential of even the most troubled students. This wasn't a one-off performance, though. Smith's versatility shone through in his diverse filmography. He brought humor to the wacky sitcom Gimme a Break and sparked curiosity in young minds with his role on the educational favorite Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? Later, he even explored the boundaries of science fiction with his starring role in Bicentennial Man, Anthony Taylor. If you watched sitcoms in the 80s and 90s, you probably laughed along with Anthony Taylor. He was a really funny guy, especially on the show Designing Women, where he played Anthony Bouvier. But that wasn't all. Anthony also showed off his acting chops as Dr. Sheldon Baylor, a plastic surgeon, on Dave's World. He wasn't afraid to try different things. 
You might have seen him pop up on shows like What's Happening Now or even a surprising guest role on Criminal Minds. Sadly, we lost Anthony to cancer in 2014. Lynn Thigpen The passing of Lynn Thigpen in 2003 left a void in the entertainment industry. The talented actress, best known for her portrayal of Ella Farmer on the police drama The District, died unexpectedly at the young age of 54. Her sudden demise necessitated writing her character out of the remaining episodes of The District's third season. The impact extended beyond that show, however. Lynn Thigpen was a singer and actress with a powerful voice and a commanding presence. She first got noticed on stage in a musical called Godspell, and she even got to be in the movie version in 1973. Lynn kept performing in plays throughout her career. She did everything from magic shows to a play called Tin Types that got nominated for a big award on Broadway. She was also really good at playing different characters at once, which she did in another play called And I Ain't Finished Yet. In 1982, Lynn landed a small role in a hilarious movie called Tootsie, even though it wasn't a big part. But that same year, she started acting on TV shows, too. She played a secretary on a sitcom called Love, Sydney, and was even part of a summer variety show. Lynn kept busy acting in movies and on TV throughout the 80s and 90s. She played a tough activist in a movie about a famous principal called Lean On Me, and even had her own sitcom role as a radio station manager. She also did more serious plays, like one opposite Billy D. Williams, and even won a Tony Award for her performance in another play. But you might actually remember Lynn best from your childhood. She was the awesome chief on the game shows, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? and Where in Time is Carmen Sandiego? She helped kids learn geography in a fun way. Adults might recognize her from soap operas like All My Children, or shows like L.A. Law and 30-something. She even landed a role in a movie called The Insider with Al Pacino and Russell Crowe. Later on, she joined the cast of another drama series called The District. It seems like no matter what the role was, Lynn Thigpen brought her talent and made it memorable. Lynn Thigpen was a Methodist and a Democrat through and through. She also never got married or had kids. In interviews, she explained that it wasn't something she ever wanted. She just didn't feel the need for those titles or the responsibilities that came with them. Sadly, Thigpen died of a cerebral hemorrhage on March 12, 2003, in her Marina del Rey, California home, outside of Los Angeles, after complaining of headaches for several days. Tom Lister Jr., Need a tough guy for your movie? Look no further than Tommy Tiny Lister Jr. This 6'5 actor wasn't afraid to play the intimidating roles, bodyguards, gangsters, soldiers, with his muscular build and shaved head. He definitely wasn't tiny, despite the nickname. Before becoming a movie regular, Tommy actually started out as a professional wrestler known as Zeus or Z Gangsta. In the mid-80s, he traded the wrestling ring for Hollywood and racked up over 100 acting credits. He wasn't just a one-trick pony, either. Tommy appeared in all sorts of films, from action thrillers to sci-fi adventures and even comedies. He even got to work with some of the biggest names in the business. Tommy Tiny Lister Jr. grew up in Compton, California, a place where trouble could easily find you. But Tommy decided to forge a different path. Instead of hanging out with gangs, he stayed home and watched old westerns, dreaming of a different life. He found inspiration in classic actors like John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. These movies sparked a passion for acting in Tommy, and he knew he wanted to be on the screen someday, creating characters that everyone would remember. Determined to make his dream a reality, Tommy set his sights on Hollywood. He landed his first movie role in 1985 alongside John Voight. Over the next few years, he kept hustling, appearing in action flicks with big stars like Andy Garcia and Eddie Murphy. He even got to share the screen with Hulk Hogan in a wrestling comedy. Tommy wasn't afraid to take on any role that came his way, building his acting experience and working his way up in Hollywood. 
The 90s were a busy time for Tommy. He kept landing roles alongside big names. He co-starred with Johnny Depp and Marlon Brando in a weird movie called Don Juan de Marco, and even worked with Quentin Tarantino a couple of times in Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead and Jackie Brown. But Tommy wasn't just about serious movies. He took a role in a hilarious comedy called Friday with Ice Cube, playing the bully everyone loved to hate, Debo. The movie was such a hit, he even came back to play Debo again in the sequel. He kept working with other comedians throughout the 90s and even appeared in some horror movies for fun. No matter the genre, Tommy kept proving his acting chops and becoming a familiar face for movie fans. Tommy kept surprising audiences with his acting choices. He wasn't afraid to ditch the tough guy roles and show off his funny side. He even played the president of a whole other planet in a sci-fi movie with Bruce Willis. He popped up in comedies with Adam Sandler and Mike Myers, too, proving he could be hilarious. And he kept working with big names, like Dustin Hoffman and Samuel L. Jackson. Mize necessitated writing her character out of the remaining episodes of The District's third season. The impact extended beyond that show, however. This might surprise you, but you can even catch some of his old wrestling matches if you look online. Tommy truly did it all. Tommy Tiny Lister may not have been an A-list star, but he was certainly one of Hollywood's most instantly recognizable and busiest character actors until his death on December 10, 2020, in Marina del Rey, California. He was 62. Mary Alice. Mary Alice, a talented actress, restarted her acting career in the mid-1960s through community theater, appearing in three plays by Douglas Turner Ward, including Days of Absence and Happy Endings. During this time, she also took on the role of washing the cast's laundry, earning a salary of $200 per week. Her dedication to her craft led her to New York City, where she performed in various productions at La Mama Experimental Theater Club in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Her first production at La Mama was Adrienne Kennedy's A Rat's Mass in September 1969, and she reprised her role in subsequent productions in October 1969 and January 1971, all directed by Seth Allen. Mary Alice also starred in Ed Bullen's Street Sounds in 1970, directed by Hugh Gittins. Her involvement with La Mama continued with appearances in Lamar Alford's Thoughts in December 1972 and January 1973. Mary Alice started her acting career on the big screen in the 70s with a movie called The Education of Sonny Carson. She also appeared on shows like Police Woman and the classic sitcom Sanford and Son. In the mid-80s, she landed a role on the soap opera All My Children. Mary's career kept going strong. In 2000, she was inducted into the prestigious American Theater Hall of Fame. A few years later, she took over the role of the Oracle in the popular movie sequel The Matrix Revolutions and even voiced the character in a video game. That was her last acting role before she retired in 2005. Sadly, Alice died on July 27, 2022, at her residence in Manhattan at the age of 85 due to natural causes. Lincoln Kilpatrick. Born in St. Louis in 1932, Lincoln Kilpatrick got the acting bug early on, thanks in part to a nudge from the legendary blues singer Billie Holiday. After graduating from college with a drama degree, Lincoln landed his first big break on Broadway, sharing the stage with Sidney Poitier in a play called A Raisin in the Sun. From there, Lincoln kept busy acting in plays throughout the 1950s and 60s. He tackled all sorts of roles, from serious dramas to comedies. He even got to work with other talented actors like Cicely Tyson and Louis Gossett Jr. Lincoln also started appearing in movies in the late 50s. He played a detective in a crime film called Cop Hater and went on to star in many memorable films throughout the years. Sci-fi fans might recognize him from The Omega Man or Fortress. He also played a priest in the movie Soylent Green and even showed his dramatic range in a movie called Together Brothers. No matter what the character, 
Lincoln Kilpatrick brought his talent and charisma to the screen. Lincoln's passion for acting extended to his family. His sons, Eric and Lincoln Jr., and his daughter DeCarla all followed in his footsteps, becoming actors, directors, and editors themselves. Sadly, Lincoln passed away from lung cancer in 2004 at the age of 72. However, his legacy as a talented actor, dedicated educator, and inspiring family man lives on. Jeffrey Holder Jeffrey Holder was a super-talented guy who could dance, act, direct, and choreograph. He even won a Tony Award. He was all over the place for over 40 years. Movies, TV, plays, even commercials. People loved his energy. Born in Trinidad in 1930, Jeffrey learned to dance and paint from his older brother. He even joined his brother's dance company when he was just seven years old. Later, he took over the company and became really successful. After a performance in St. Thomas, a famous dance lady named Agnes DeMille, her dad was a big-shot movie director, spotted Jeffrey's dance troupe and invited them to New York in 1954. To make the trip happen, Jeffrey, who was also a talented painter, sold a bunch of his artwork. He was so good, he even won an award to study painting later. His dance company, now called Jeffrey Holder and Company, performed in New York City for several years. In 1954, Jeffrey got his first taste of Broadway in a musical called House of Flowers. This show had a Caribbean theme, and guess what? Jeffrey even got to choreograph a dance number himself. The show wasn't a huge hit, but it was a big moment for Jeffrey. Here's the coolest part. He met his wife, Carmen, another dancer in the show, and they had a son together. On top of all that, Jeffrey even became a principal dancer with the Metropolitan Opera Ballet for a while. It sounds like 1954 to 1956 was a whirlwind of success for Jeffrey. In the 2000s and 2010s, Lockhart took on several recurring and multi-episode minor roles on series such as The Lying Game, Dragnet, The West Wing, NCIS, various law and order shows, and Chicago Fire. These roles were often uncredited and featured her as a policewoman. She also appeared in single-episode roles on shows like Studio 60 on The Sunset Strip, Reigns and Chase, and had a role in the BJ and the Bear episode, Fire in the Hole. Besides her work in television and film, Lockhart has been active in commercials and voice acting. In 1997, she co-founded the Kingsman Shakespeare Festival with Lane Davies, which later evolved into the Kingsman Shakespeare Company, offering seminars and summer camps for children aged 8-16 to learn various acting techniques. Recently, she appeared on stage as Eleanor in The Lion in Winter, 2010, and as Virginia in It's Only a Play, 2016, at River City Repertory Theater. On December 24, 1986, Lockhart married Adam Carlisle Taylor, the son of Gunsmoke actors Buck Taylor and Judy Nugent. They had two children, a daughter, Carlisle, and a son, Zane, who tragically died in a motorcycle accident in Ennis, Montana, on June 4, 1994. As a Catholic, Lockhart had the honor of meeting Pope John Paul II in 1985 during a papal audience in St. Peter's Square. Additionally, she is a skilled horsewoman, having won championships in cutting, reining, team penning, and barrel racing. Catherine Hickland as Stephanie Stevie March. Stephanie Knight was a character on Knight Rider. She was the wife of Michael Long. Like Michael, Stevie was deeply in love with him, expressing in episode 220, Let it be me, that he was the only one for her, as she thought of him constantly throughout the day. In 1987, she temporarily replaced Catherine Kelly Lang as Brooke Logan on The Bold and the Beautiful, while Lang was ill. She also portrayed Tess Wilder on Loving, 1993-1995, and The City, 1995-1997. From 1998 to 2009, Hicklin played Lindsay Rappaport on One Life to Live, reprising the role in 2012 towards the end of the show's run. She made guest appearances on various TV series, including Chips, 1983, Airwolf, 
1985, and both Law and Order and Law and Order, Criminal Intent, 2001-2005. Hicklin's first book, The 30-Day Heartbreak Cure, A Guide to Getting Over Him and Back Out There. One Month from Today was published in December 2008 by Simon & Schuster. Her second book, Cat and Fern's Excellent God Adventure, Daily Inspirations for 365 Days of Heaven on Earth, co-written with Fern Underwood and Lindsay Harrison, came out in December 2014. Since 2008, Hickland has also worked as a hypnotist. Hickland's first marriage was to Richard Ernest Knowlton on October 10, 1981, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They divorced on March 23, 1982. She was married to David Hasselhoff from March 24, 1984, to March 1, 1989. On June 27, 1992, she wed All My Children star Michael E. Knight, and they lived in Manhattan until their divorce in 2006. Following this, Hickland married producer Todd Fisher on December 22, 2012. The couple has a residence in Las Vegas and a ranch in California. Hickland identifies as a Christian. Jack Starrett as Hagen. Jack Starrett portrayed Hagen in the series. Hailing from Refugio, Texas, Starrett worked in the oil fields before pursuing a career in Hollywood. He is known for his role as Coach Jennings in the 1961 film like Father, Like Son, reprising the role in The Young Sinner, 1965, and again in Like Father, Like Son, in 1987. Valerie Starrett, his former wife, revealed that Jack aspired more to direct than to act. He took an uncredited directorial role when the original director of The Girls from Thunderstrip required assistance. Starrett also starred in three short films helmed by Tony Schweikla, with whom he forged a close friendship that lasted until Starrett's passing. The Library of Congress deemed one of Schweikely's films culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant, preserving it in the National Film Registry. Sadly, Starrett passed away at 52 due to liver failure in Sherman Oaks, California. His sister confirmed that he had been unwell for a while. At the time of his death, he was married to Valerie Starrett. Phyllis Davis as Tanya Walker. Tanya, an insidious industrial spy, is filching technological secrets and pilfering funds from a computer firm. This unscrupulous individual also entangled herself romantically with an internationally wanted criminal, Cameron Zachary. In a sinister plot, she attempted to take the life of Lieutenant Michael Arthur Long, an LAPD detective who was unwittingly involved in a case linked to her deceitful activities. Unbeknownst to him, he was dating his betrayer. In the late 1960s, Paul decided to focus more on TV and movies again. He guest-starred on tons of shows, including a groundbreaking sitcom called Julia, starring another talented black actor, Diahan Carroll. He also started getting roles in movies, working alongside Sidney Poitier in The Lost Man. It wasn't quite superstardom yet, but Paul was definitely on his way. 1972 was a game-changer for Paul. He landed the lead role opposite Cicely Tyson in a movie called Sounder. It was a powerful story about a family struggling to survive, and Paul's performance was incredible. He even got nominated for an Oscar for Best Actor, one of the few black actors to get that honor at the time. After Sounder, the interesting roles just kept coming for Paul. He played all sorts of important people in TV movies, from historical figures like Thurgood Marshall to sports legends like baseball player Roy Campanella. He even got nominated for an Emmy Award for playing Martin Luther King Jr., alongside his Sounder co-star Cicely Tyson, who played Coretta Scott King. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Paul continued to be a major force in Hollywood. He starred in a bunch of high-quality movies and miniseries like Backstairs at the White House and Roots the Next Generations. He wasn't afraid to take on different characters, from serious dramas to lighter comedies like Sister, Sister. Even though Paul wasn't quite as big a star as Sidney Poitier, he kept acting in quality TV shows throughout the 90s, like Breathing Lessons. He finally won an Emmy Award for a guest role on a show called 
picket fences after being nominated twice before. In his later years, Paul lent his voice to a crime show and even reprised a role from his earlier movie Sounder in a TV movie. He also had a recurring role on a popular show called Touched by an Angel. Suffering from obesity and diabetes in later life, Paul Winfield passed away from a heart attack at age 64 in 2004 and was survived by a sister, Patricia. His longtime companion of 30 years, set designer and architect Charles Gillen Jr., predeceased him by two years, Mel Stewart. Mel Stewart was a busy guy. He was an actor, director, and even a musician. Throughout the 1960s to the 1990s, you could catch him on TV shows and movies. He's probably best known for his roles on shows like All in the Family and Scarecrow and Mrs. King. But before he hit the small screen, Mel started out on the stage. Stewart dipped his toes into the acting world in the late 1950s, landing small roles in various television shows and movies. But his talents extended far beyond the screen. By the early 60s, Mel was also making a name for himself on the prestigious Broadway stage. He appeared in several productions, including Pearly Victorious and the light-hearted Simply Heavenly. He possessed a captivating voice that he lent to some truly unique projects. One such project involved narrating a jazz piece that incorporated the writings of the famous poet Langston Hughes. This innovative collaboration showcased Mel's ability to bridge the gap between different artistic mediums. In fact, Mel even recorded an entire album dedicated to Langston Hughes' poetry, bringing the author's words to life for a wider audience. Mel actively participated in the San Francisco improv scene, honing his comedic timing and ability to think on his feet as part of a group called The Committee. His talents even caught the attention of a popular talk show host, landing him an appearance on The Dick Cavett Show back in 1969. He landed guest spots on shows like That Girl and Good Times. But his big break came when he scored the role of Henry Jefferson, George Jefferson's brother, on the iconic sitcom All in the Family. He played the part for three seasons, leaving a lasting impression on audiences. In the 80s, Mel landed another starring role in the spy drama Scarecrow and Mrs. King, playing section chief Billy Melrose for four seasons. Even after that show ended, Mel continued to stay busy with guest appearances on various shows and movies. His acting career spanned decades, with his last on-screen credit coming in the early 90s. Sadly, on February 24, 2002, Mel Stewart died of Alzheimer's disease. Ben Powers Powers started out in the Northeast. Born in Brooklyn and raised in Rhode Island, he honed his craft at the Rhode Island School of Design. His big break came in his hometown of Providence, working with director Adrian Hall at Trinity Repertory Theater. But Powers wasn't just a stage actor. He was a multi-talented entertainer. Stand-up comedy? Check. Impressions? You bet. Singing? Both standards and his own original music. This versatility caught the eye of a Hollywood agent, and Powers found himself transitioning from Provident stages to the bright lights of Las Vegas and Hollywood. He even entertained audiences at Playboy clubs in several cities. Mr. Plot, she attempted to take the life of Lieutenant Michael Arthur Long, an LAPD detective who was unwittingly involved in a case linked to her deceitful activities. Unbeknownst to him, he was dating his betrayer. In the late 1960s, Paul decided to focus more on TV and movies again. After landing a role on Good Times, Powers became a familiar face on TV. Throughout the 80s, he guest starred on popular shows like Gimme a Break and Laverne and Shirley. He even had a starring role on the detective drama Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer until the show's unfortunate cancellation. After leaving the Mod Squad in the mid-80s, Clarence stepped away from the Hollywood spotlight. In the early 80s, he appeared in a few movies here and there, including comedies like Cheech and Chong's Next Movie. He also did some TV movies. 
Sadly, Clarence passed away from liver cancer in 2015 at the age of 64. Roscoe Lee Brown Roscoe Lee Brown was a master class in cerebral eloquence and audience command. And although his dominant playing card in the realm of acting was quite serious and stately, nobody cut a more delightfully dry edge in sitcoms than this gentleman, whose calm yet blistering put-downs often eluded his lesser victims. He went to Lincoln University, a historically black college, but his education got put on hold when he served in World War II. After the war, he finished his degree and even got a master's from Columbia. He seemed like he might become a teacher, but then something unexpected happened. He had always been a great athlete, and in fact, he even won a world championship in track. He used his athletic fame to land a sales job, but in 1956, he decided to take a big chance. With no acting experience, he auditioned for a play and somehow landed the role. This was the spark that ignited his new passion, acting. From there, he never looked back and went on to perform in many Shakespearean plays. Roscoe Lee Brown's deep voice and distinguished presence made him a standout actor, especially on the traditionally white classical stage. He even shared the stage with James Earl Jones in a famous play called The Blacks in the early 60s. He started winning awards for his acting, like an Obie Award for playing a rebellious slave. But Broadway wasn't always easy. His first play there only lasted one night. Even in his 80s, Roscoe Lee Brown kept working. He never married and lived a private life, but his voice was still famous. One of his last jobs was narrating a Garfield movie, and he even lent his voice to a funny movie called Epic Movie that came out in 2007, the same year he sadly passed away from cancer. Thanks for watching. Who was your favorite character and why? Share your thoughts and memories in the comments below. Who will be featured on our next classic sitcom cast tribute? Stay tuned to find out. See you next time. On the screen. By the early 60s, Mel was also making a name for himself on the prestigious Broadway stage. He appeared in several productions, including Pearly Victorious and the light-hearted Simply Heavenly. He possessed a captivating voice that he lent to some truly unique projects. One such project involved narrating a jazz piece that incorporated the writings of the famous poet Langston Hughes. This innovative collaboration showcased Mel's ability to bridge the gap between different artistic mediums. In fact, Mel even recorded an entire album dedicated to Langston Hughes' poetry, bringing the author's words to life for a wider audience. Mel actively participated in the San Francisco improv scene, honing his comedic timing and ability to think on his feet as part of a group called The Committee. His talents even caught the attention of a popular talk show host, landing him an appearance on The Dick Cavett Show back in 1969. He landed guest spots on shows like That